Greetings in that strong and blessed name of Jesus. Welcome to Fully Alive. My name is Pastor Abe Jeter. Well, praise our God, we are back on track today. Amen. Um, let me just say that Fully Alive Ministry is an outreach ministry of the Church of God of Cleveland located at 111. Zero Zero Union Avenue. So again, thank you for being with us today. We're excited about our lesson. We're back on track. We're studying uh, the Gospel of Luke. Amen. Chapter 3. Amen. Well, praise our God. Amen. And so in chapter 3, uh, John the Baptist uh, starts his public ministry. Uh, Jesus also starts his public ministry. Amen? Well, praise our God. All right, listen. All right, I'm just going to start with uh, uh, verse 1 in chapter 3. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then we'll expound on those verses and share some historical information, and then we're going to keep on moving on down, okay? Well, praise our God. Amen. Begin reading then in Luke chapter 3. Amen? Verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Enteria and Trichonitis and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. Anus and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Well, praise our God. Now, Luke, uh, the master historian, pinpoints the exact time when these things came to pass. Amen. Luke clearly shows who was in political power when the word of God came to John Baptist to start his public ministry. This, this was a real event uh, in time, space, and history so that it can be documented. Well, praise God. And so, uh, just giving you some historical uh, information, uh, reading from the commentary of uh, uh, Albert Barnes notes in the Bible it says uh, now in the fifth year it was the 15th year rather of the reign of Tiberius Caesar uh, he says this was the 13th year of his being sole emperor he was two years joint emperor with Augustus Caesar Augustus and Luke reckons from the time when he was admitted to share the empire with Augustus Caesar, amen, uh, until, of course, he, so 15 years. All right. Uh, now, this Tiberius Caesar succeeded Augustus in the empire and began his sole reign in August 1914 uh, AD. He was a most infamous character a scourge to the Roman people. He reigned for 23 years, okay? All right. Anyway, uh, during his time, of course, uh, Pontius Pilate was appointed. Uh, um, well, he, Herod the Great had left his kingdom to three sons and uh, to Archelaus, he left Judea, Judea. Archelaus reigned nine years when on account of his crimes, he was banished into Vienna. And Judea was made a Roman province and placed entirely under the Roman governors or procurators and became completely tributary to Rome. Pontius Pilate was the fifth governor that had been sent. And of course, had been in Judea but a short time and when John the Baptist started his ministry. So obviously when 
he came face to face with Jesus, pointing his pilot at us, and he hadn't been governor very long. Okay, at any point, uh, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and I already told you that uh, Herod the Great divided his, his kingdom into his, among his sons, okay? And that one son uh, got the boot, okay? And that's why um, Rome uh, put governors over there. And, but on the other hand, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, this, this was Herod Antipas, okay? Son of Herod the Great to whom Galilee had been left as part of his father's kingdom. Uh, the word Tetrarch properly denotes one who presides over a fourth part of a country or province, but it also came to be a general title, denoting one who reigned over any part, because in this case, a third part, okay? Anyway, uh, it was this Herod who imprisoned John the Baptist, and to whom our Savior, when reign, was sent by Pilate. And his brother, Philip, was Tetrarch of Iturea. Or Iturea. It was situated on the east side of Jordan and was taken from the descendants of Jeter uh, by the tribes of Reuben and Gad uh, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, First Chronicles 5.19. Uh, the region of Trachonitis, this region was also on the east uh, of Jordan and extended northward to the district of Damascus and eastward to the desert of Arabia. It was bounded on the west by Golonitis and south by the city of Bostra. Philip had obtained this region from the Romans on condition that he uh, would get rid of the robbers. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene. Abilene was so-called from Abila, its chief city. It was situated in Syria, northwest of Damascus, southwest of Mount Lebanon, and was adjacent to Galilee, okay? And that information was taken from Abbott Barnes' notes on the Bible. Just giving you a little bit of history, amen. So easy to read across all those things. And so uh, let's focus on John Baptist's assignment, okay? The why of John's call and mission. Because the Bible says, uh, during the reign of the above people, amen, the word of God came to John, okay? Praise our God, amen? And of course, uh, John Baptist obeyed uh, God and began uh, to uh, powerfully proclaim the word of God with a powerful anointing on his life, being filled of, with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, amen? And I just want to say something to you young preachers out there. You know, some of you guys uh, have, have got the call. Uh, you know you have the call. You know you, you're anointed. You know you're you spirit-filled. But that doesn't mean you're supposed to go start preaching. That doesn't mean you're supposed to go and start trying to pastor. Uh, no, John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And uh, uh, for 30 years... <laughs> Uh, God was training him and preparing him, and he could not start his public ministry until the word of God came to him and say, it was time, and you shouldn't be trying to start your public ministry until the word of God come to you and say, it's time. I mean, you, you can share your faith. I mean, people will invite you to preach, and, but my friend, you need to be still under the authority of your pastor or your mentor until such time God says it's Time. Well, praise our God. Somebody says, where did that come from? Anyway, listen. Amen. And so uh, John's assignment was to prepare the way for Jesus or prepare the hearts of people to receive Jesus. Well, praise our God. So the Bible tells us in Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 3, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Now, listen, repentance, uh, coming to a place where you're ready to turn away from all known sin and the right to run your life independently of God. Now, the Holy Ghost has to bring you to this place. 
you can't really come to repentance on your own. Bible repentance requires the work of the Holy Spirit on your life. Jesus says, no man can come unto me unless uh, God draw him. And he draws you through the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, there's an anointing on John the Baptist's life, okay? Amen. And uh, uh, it was an exciting time. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. And he came preaching the baptism of repentance. And not only were these people willing to repent, turn away from some things, they made a public confession because they got baptized a public baptism for the remissions of sin. You know, I got a problem with people who, who said that they're saved, they're saying that, you know, I made this decision, but they don't want to get baptized. When they don't want to get baptized, it lets me know that something is not settled in their spirit. But I also have a problem with people who really don't have the goods, and they want to get baptized and hoping that something's going to happen. Well, nothing's going to happen. You can go down there, a, a wet center, a dry center, and come out of a wet center. No, you need to come to the place of repentance. Well, Praise God and, and make that commitment by faith. And then you follow the Lord in water baptism. Well, praise the Lord. Okay. And so uh, verse four says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every revenge will be filled. And every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. And that's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, that voice was crying. It was telling them what to do, come to a place to make the path straight. You know, uh, all these valleys will be filled. Crooked places become straight and all those kind of things, people need to be willing to come to that place. And when that happens, they can see the salvation of God manifest in their life. But anyway, uh, Luke was quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And that, and verse 3 through 5, and it says, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you to where the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Well, uh, let's just look at some of those expressions, because we believe that they're uh, speaking about spiritual things, okay? Every valley shall be filled. Uh, John Gill, uh, in his commentary, uh, says, Luke cites more out of the same prophecy as relating to the times of John the Baptist and the Messiah than other evangelists, Matthew and Mark, uh, do. Uh, in, the, in the prophet, it is, every valley shall be exalted, which is done by filling it up. Uh, the metaphor is persistent in of preparing and clearing the way for the coming of the Messiah, done by the ministry of John, under which such souls were lowly and humble and, and depressed with a sense of sin, should be raised and directed to believe in Christ and be filled with divine consolation from him. Uh, these words are owned uh, also by the, the Jews, uh, uh, in their commentaries, to belong to the, the world to come, that is, uh, the times of Messiah, uh, though they understood them of making way for the return of the Israelites from captivity by Messiah, just as they supposed such things were done by the miraculous cloud for the children of Israel as they passed through the wilderness, of which they say that it went before them, smote the serpents and scorpions and fiery servants and and, and the rock, and if there were any low places, it raised it up, or high places, it made it low, and called them to be plain, uh, caused them to be plain, as it is said in Isaiah 40, uh, verse 3, and every valley shall be exalted. So the Jews were saying that, hey, hey, that cloud went before them and did all these things. Now, whether they did all those things or not, that's that's what they were saying. Uh, 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 but, but what they say of this cloud, literally, as preparing 
the way for the Israelites, it is a spiritual sense true of the ministry of John, whereby John, uh, whereby many of the children of Israel had the way prepared for them uh, for the reception of Messiah. When as every humble soul had his expectation raised and his faith and courage and his heart filled with spiritual joy. So such as were proud and haughty were humble. It says every mountain and hill shall be brought low. All such as are elated with their own abilities and boast of their righteousness, trust in themselves and look with disdain and contempt on others, their loftiness shall be bowed down. Their haughtiness made low. And he, the Messiah alone, in his person, grace, and righteousness be exalted. And the crooked shall be made straight, such as are of a crooked spirit and walk in crooked ways with the workers of iniquity shall have new spirits given them and be directed to right ways and be led in the path of righteousness and truth. And the rough places shall be made smooth and meant that men of rough tempers comparable to lions and bears shall become quiet and peaceful, smooth and easy, and moreover, whatever difficulties were in the minds of men concerning the Messiah at the end of his coming and the nature of his kingdom and whatever impediments were in the way of embracing him when, uh, when come should now be removed, at least for many persons. Amen? Well, praise our God. And, and, and so the idea is that uh, this ministry of repentance and reconciliation, folks coming to that place where they want that change, where they're uh, willing to uh, surrender, amen, and get baptized, amen, expecting uh, the Messiah, amen. Well, praise our God, John's ministry, a ministry of repentance and reconciliation, amen. And of course, uh, Malachi uh, 4, 5, and 6, we know that people approach this from a number of ways. Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth of the curse. <clears throat> Many people see this <clears throat> uh, being fulfilled uh, when the armies of Rome and the Titus uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem and, and destroyed the temple. But hey, like I said, there's many ways to approach this. But, 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 amen. But Elijah coming before and Elijah with a ministry of repentance and reconciliation, uh, turning the hearts of fathers to the children, turning the hearts of children to the father. Now, <laughs> uh, some see this as going to be fulfilled immediately preceding the second coming of Jesus. Well, I'll tell you what, if there was ever a time where the Hearts of the Father should be turned to the children. And the hearts of the children turned to the Father. Uh, this is the time. And I say it's particularly true in the black community because we have so many uh, single parent uh, households, so many households without fathers, and uh, so many uh, children angry with the Father. Listen, amen. Uh, God is talking about a, a, a move of God's Spirit that's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. I'm praying that uh, um, that there'll be some reconciliation take place and that there's some fathers who are hearing this message that the Spirit of God would touch and turn their hearts toward their children and they're going to make, uh, make some things right with them, okay? Or uh, there's some children who's listening, who's angry with dad because he took off and he hadn't spent the time with them. Uh, seek dad out and there'll be some turning of hearts of the children to dad. I'm praying for uh, reconciliation to take place. I'm praying for some repentance to take place. Well, praise God. So John, amen, was his ministry was to make some ways straight, preparing some hearts uh, of the people to receive Jesus, okay? Amen. Powerful ministry, a powerful anointing. I want you to understand that uh, this was a major event. There wasn't just a, a few people tricking him to John. 
I want you to understand that hundreds trickled to him and maybe thousands, okay? Amen. It was a, a big thing, okay? It got the attention of the whole community. It got the attention of the whole city. It got the attention of the nation, okay? Well, praise our God. Listen, it was a time when uh, there was great expectation in the atmosphere. They anticipated Messiah was about to come. They just sensed that uh, the kingdom was going to break forth anytime. Of course, uh, the idea of the kingdom was that uh, Messiah would be a military uh, Messiah and that uh, uh, there'd be an overthrow of a Roman government somehow and the Jews would be put in and to that uh, prominent position. Uh, but uh, uh, God had some other things, and he sent a, a, a lamb, a, uh, a meek and mild Jesus, amen, who did establish a kingdom. Well, praise God. Amen. Well, praise God. Listen, listen, listen. It was a big event, amen. They flocked to John, hundreds, okay, and maybe even thousands. There was an expectation of the kingdom in the atmosphere. Amen. And you're going to read just a little bit. As John began to teach and preach, they wondered in their heart, was he the Messiah? You know, because they were anticipating the Messiah. And John had to respond. And you know, I already told you about uh, in the third chapter of Matthew, uh, of John, brother. Amen. John the Baptist came. Not John the Baptist, but, but uh, wow, having a, a, a senior moment. Amen. But uh, Nicodemus came by night. And uh, Master, we know you must be from God because no man can do the miracles you do except God be with him. And Jesus just cut through the chase because he knew what was on the brother's heart. He says, "Unless except you be born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Except you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. And it was so far over his head, he like, wait a minute, can I be, uh, do, can a man enter a second time uh, in his mother's womb and be born? But, but the kingdom was on their mind. And John the Baptist's message was, according to uh, Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist's message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within reach. And Jesus' message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was in reach, not 2,000 years from now. And he did set up a kingdom, praise our God, in his first advent. All right. All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. All right. Listen, John had a powerful, no-nonsense message. He was a powerful, no-nonsense preacher. He spoke to the heart. He spoke to the need. He called sin, sin, okay? He also addressed the sins of political leaders. He did not have to worry about being taken off Facebook or Twitter. Amen. Uh, he didn't have to worry about the cancel culture that we have to face today, but but the cancel culture was there. What do you mean? Because uh, he ended up being put in jail, and later he ended up being beheaded, okay? Yeah, all right? And that kind of thing is probably going to be coming as our nation continues to go left. All right, well, praise our God. Listen, okay. Luke, uh, verse seven. And so he began saying to the crowds who were going, going out to be baptized by him, you broad of vipers, who want you to flee from the wrath to come? And of course, other scriptures let us know that he was speaking that kind of harsh language to the religious hypocrites, you know. Uh, they were coming to get baptized, not so much because they really want to repent, but because everybody else was. And it wouldn't look good for the religious leaders not to be getting baptized. <laughs> and John was saying to them, amen, you brought up vipers who want you to flee the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Somebody says, what stones were you talking about? He was talking about those stony heart, hearts of those religious hypocrites. God is able to take those stone hearted hearts and raise up children to Abraham. And he was warning them. He was letting them know, amen, that they need to bear forth fruit. Because I'm not going to be baptizing you hypocrites. 
You you need to bring forth some fruit, uh, uh, meat for repentance. I know, and that's why a lot of uh, conservative churches uh, don't want to baptize people right away. But you know, they they baptize uh, you know folks right away in, in the in the New Testament. Amen. Uh, the Ethiopian you you don't see this water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now it's been some of us. We go no no no. We're gonna to have to wait two weeks and see how you walk and see how you live. We want to do the work of the Holy Ghost, so we need to have some balance here, okay? Well, I understand, I understand your heart, but I'm just saying, okay? But in this case, uh, uh, John was saying to these uh, hypocritical religious leaders, "You need to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance," okay? And he goes on, to let them know that the axe is laid uh, to the root. Of the tree, he says, okay, uh, bear fruits, verse 8, uh, and keep with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham for our father, for I said to you that for of these from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham, verse 9, indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, so every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and he, he's let him know, amen, <laughs> that the judgment of God is already laid to the axe. You know, the word of God, uh, uh, when you're under that uh, powerful anointing, amen, of the word, it's like the axe is uh, laid to the root of the tree because it takes away all your false security. It, it, it causes you to see uh, that you don't have a leg to stand on, okay? Amen. And now, God ain't gonna wait till you get to judgment day for, for you to see that. Uh, he in his mercy is gonna send a, uh, a, a Holy Ghost preacher who's going to preach the word straight to you, uh, cause you to see uh, where you are and what you need to do. Amen. <laughs> Expose your hypocrisy. I believe it's in the 28th chapter of Isaiah. It's talking about when the overflowing scourge comes through, it, 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 it's going to be, uh, it'll make a bed uh, 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 shorter than a man can stretch out on or, 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 or cover up because the word of God's going to expose your sin and you can't be comfortable in that position anymore. Well, praise God. And when the word of God goes forth, it takes the, uh, 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 the form it needs to. Sometimes it, it's water so it can smoke you out of your hide, your cracks. Sometimes it's hell because it needs to uh, fall hard on you and get you to move. Well, praise our God. Anyway, listen. All right. He says, indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so, as I say, you come to church and, and a Holy Ghost preacher is preaching the word of God and you find yourself in a fiery furnace. It's real hot and you don't know what to do. My God, uh, because Holy Ghost conviction has seized your heart. God in his mercy showing you the truth of your condition. Amen. But there will be a time where you're going to be cast into the lake of fire because you rejected Jesus Christ. So you have a time now. And God is ministering to you. Those honest from every walk of life repented and was baptized publicly and wanted to know what to do from this point on because we find them saying, what shall we do? Okay. And that's what happens when real repentance takes place. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 got saved. But the Bible says they were pricked to the heart with that Holy Ghost preaching of Peter. And they cried, men and brethren, what shall we do? My God, we'll pray for a fresh anointing of your Holy Ghost. My God, we'll pray for Holy Ghost preaching. My God, empower me that I might preach with that unction and that anointing that men and women will cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We're going to pick up on here next week, okay? We're going to pick up here on verse 10 next week. The Lord bless you. The Lord smile on you and give you peace. Love you. Bless you.